Muy bien, seguimos adelante y le damos por favor la palabra a la señora Isabel Novoa Pontón, fundadora y CEO del consorcio Novis en Ecuador. Bienvenida, la escuchamos. Muy buenos días y muchas gracias por la invitación al décimo primer foro de competitividad de las Américas, que tiene como finalidad definir las prioridades para una recuperación post-COVID. Nuestro país, el Ecuador, ha venido enfrentando grandes desafíos por un legado de altos niveles de indisciplina fiscal, pobreza, corrupción y falta de cohesión social, problemas crónicos que hasta ahora han impedido aprovechar las grandes oportunidades en diversos sectores. En el 2019, nosotros ya vivíamos una situación económica muy compleja, un país en recesión altamente endeudado por el déficit fiscal del sector público y el bajo precio del petróleo, por citar algunas razones, que hasta el momento, gracias, gracias a Dios, la hemos podido super, super, superar y han sido aliviadas pero no solucionadas. A esto se sumó en marzo del 2020 el terror por la pandemia del COVID-19, siendo Guayaquil el epicentro de la emergencia sanitaria al inicio de la crisis. Poco tardó este en agudizarse también en Quito y en todo el país. De acuerdo con cifras oficiales, entre marzo y mayo del 2020, en el país se registraron 1.2 millones de empleos perdidos y se reportó un femicidio cada 72 horas. A ellos se implementó la modalidad de trabajo y educación a manera virtual. El gobierno tomó las primeras decisiones para enfrentar la pandemia pero también los empresarios del sector privado de Quito y Guayaquil, ciudades principales, nos organizamos entonces en comités para iniciar la reactivación y aportar inclusive con recursos propios para cubrir la emergencia sanitaria social. Invertimos mucho dinero personal e infraestructura y en 48 horas formamos un fideicomiso transparente para poder atender las necesidades más urgentes y por escala ir aliviando las urgencias de los hospitales, pacientes, fallecidos, médicos, policías, militares, fiscales, choferes de transporte público, entre otros. Ahora estamos frente al desafío de lograr una recuperación sostenible, adaptando los modelos de negocios a la nueva situación, aumentando la capacidad de resiliencia, de innovación y ajustando la propuesta de valor a la nueva realidad. Desde el consorcio Novis, holding de inversiones diversificadas que represento, Hemos podido tener un balance en nuestra generación de ingresos con afectaciones diferentes que van desde las más críticas a nivel de mercado, como la caída del negocio de hotelería, hasta las que han generado picos de demanda, como el alcohol para uso sanitario. La adaptación a nuevas estructuras y estrategias ha sido clave en los temas mencionados. Demostrar nuestra responsabilidad social con la comunidad y colaboradores incorporando la digitalización con más fuerza en nuestros procesos y nuevos servicios ha sido nuestro norte. Tenemos la certeza que para acelerar la reactivación sostenible necesitamos que el país resuelva con urgencia el conflicto generado en la primera vuelta de las elecciones, tomando las autoridades electorales sus responsabilidades y actuando 
con transparencia y dentro de las leyes. Lograr consolidar el plan de vacunación es una prioridad para recuperar al país de manera rápida y sostenida. Y para lograrla competitivamente, debemos establecer alianzas entre el sector público, privado y sociedad civil, obteniendo una mejor negociación y logística de distribución que nos permita llegar a todos los sectores de manera eficiente, ética y equitativa. Instaurar una infraestructura dura, masiva de telecomunicación para homologar e implementar la educación virtual y la telemedicina es urgente, pues esta pandemia oculta enfermedades crónicas, no contagiosas, como el infarto y la diabetes. Se ha cumplido el Fortalecer tiempo, por favor. la dolarización con políticas económicas consistentes, solucionando el déficit fiscal, generando incentivos en los sectores de agroexportación turística, minero y de infraestructura, y reduciendo el riesgo país para traer inversiones. Por su parte, el gobierno necesariamente debe implementar una eficiencia regulatoria y reformas en el área laboral, ambiental, tributaria, política, sin olvidar la sostenibilidad de los fondos de pensiones, las que requieren un gran apoyo multisectorial y trabajar con los sectores y liderazgos más influyentes del país para poder llegar a un acuerdo razonable por un Ecuador con mejor gobernabilidad, más competitivo y próspero. Estoy convencida que nosotros, el sector empresarial, cumplimos un rol fundamental en el desarrollo del país, no solo creando trabajo, sino siendo parte de la solución de esos desafíos. Por eso son claves las alianzas entre el gobierno, el sector empresarial, la academia y la sociedad civil. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por sus palabras, la señora Novoa Pontón. Le ofrecemos la palabra ahora al señor Eduardo Suárez, vicepresidente para América Latina de Scotia Bank. Lo escuchamos. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to join you today in this fantastic event. Um, Uh, we are huge believers in the Americas. As a bank, one of the anecdotes that gives us our identity is that we actually had a presence in, in the Caribbean before we actually had branches in front of what is today the financial capital of Canada. Uh, we, we truly see ourselves as a bank for the Americas, and there are very important reasons why we see such an attractive prospect in, in the region. It's a region with, with a very youthful and, and vibrant population, huge natural resource endowments, and very complementary economies. If you drive from the northern tip of the hemisphere to its southern one, you will basically tick the boxes of every major economic sector in, in the world. Yeah, and we think that means that the region has a very uh, natural uh, strategic partnership. And, and because of that, we, we see it as core to our own identity. Um, however, uh, like, like everywhere in the world, the region has very important challenges to, to continue to develop into the, 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 the continent that we would like to see it be. Um, among them, there are important shocks hitting the world economy, which are, are, hurting, are, are hitting uh, countries and are hitting uh, companies like ourselves. Among them, uh, we have, for example, the, the renewables energy sector, uh, which is dis disrupting uh, the way we used to see energy happen. Uh, the, the, the leaders in the region, uh, thankfully, have a very um, fortunate juggling act in the sense that they have very important assets in the sector right now. They have very important uh, endowments of traditional resources such as coal, gas, and oil. But fortunately, they also have very important endowments in things like gas, sorry, like wind, water, and sun. Uh, uh, that, getting that transition right will be very important in order to power the region for it. It's actually something that's <laughs> very important for ourselves. Our CEO has <laughs> we will deploy a uh, hundred billion dollars of our own balance sheet to help finance that transition <coughs> here. Uh, 
uh, we take that to heart and we think the region uh, has very important prospects here. Another very important shock which is disrupting us all is the digital and information <laughs> economy which is arriving and hitting uh, the planet as we speak. Uh, as an industry, we're being very heavily disrupted, but so is every other sector. The region, fortunately, has very important assets already in the sense that it has a penetration of, of the technology we need to play here, uh, internet penetration, mobile phone penetration. Um, it has a large market that is growing and a population that is growing. However, in order to fully touch this sector and others, uh, there are important challenges that we need to tackle together. Um, the, uh, the first one, which is, which is and will be very important, is, is contract enforcement. The region has made very important strides here, but in order to, to give the incentives for innovators, uh, countries need to protect contracts, which are what provide the, the entrepreneurs with, with the drive and incentives by knowing that their, their work will get the reward that it needs. Uh, we need to see uh, important uh, achievements in security. Sadly, some of the countries in the region uh, need work on this front, and security is something that not only puts a cost on business, but it, it attracts, a, it, it hits its citizen on their daily lives. Uh, we also need to see a, a efforts on financial inclusion in which we ourselves need to be a part of. And that financial inclusion is thankfully made better by technology, but, but we all need to, to invent ourselves. That is why, for example, we as a bank are building digital factories. So we try to implement these technologies to, in order to make the life of the citizens in the hemisphere better by implementing innovation. And we've built digital factories in many of our hubs throughout Latin America and in Canada. Uh, but I think most importantly of all, uh, the biggest asset that the region has is its people. In order to fully tap the potential of that, of, the, of that people, we need to invest very heavily in education. It's not for nothing that the digital economy is also known as a knowledge economy. And uh, the, the region, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, lags much of the rest of the world as we see in the PISA uh, results. But fortunately, on the other hand, we have seen very consistent improvement in every country in the region in educational achievement. That is, I think the most important message and the final ma message I want to leave today is that uh, in order to fully tap the potential of the region and be able to, to not only be, uh, ride along on these new sectors of the economy, but actually drive them, we need to make very important effort in education. And that is something where the private sector and the public sectors of the region will need to form a very important partnership. And with that, I will leave it because I think I'm basically at the end of my time. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por su participación al señor Suárez. Invitamos ahora al señor Jeff Kratz de Amazon Web Services, director para América Latina, Caribe y Canadá. Si por favor puede encender su cámara y su micrófono, lo escuchamos. Yeah, well, and thank you. And first of all, I'd like to thank OIS for this opportunity to, to share some observations and thoughts while extending out <clears throat> to not only all the wonderful speakers and inspiring that we've already heard, but to all attendees for our continued thoughts and prayers during these very uncharted times of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Please continue being safe. Hope is on the horizon for all of us. Um, you know, th these are very new times. And during the past year, we've witnessed amazing innovation demonstrated by governments, elected and appointed officials, throughout the Americas, responding to the needs of their customers, citizens that they're vowed to protect. Now governments have acted as startups. It's amazing and exciting to see. And that has driven a country's acceleration in not only digital transformation, but absolutely in competitiveness as well. This has resulted in improved citizen services throughout the region, from countries of all economic means, size, maturity, and more, different dimensions across the region. Practically, we now have students taking classes at home, such as the city of Sao Paulo, where 170,000 teachers now instruct 5 million students a day. And while, while we all agree that having students on the playgrounds and back in the classroom is much preferred, these cloud services now are extending out to the reach of education into rural communities. In Colombia, 
The Duque administration has harnessed the power of artificial intelligence to not only track the outbreak of COVID-19, but to ensure that hospitals and clinics alike have the necessary PPE equipment to serve their patients. Mexico, robots now are being deployed in select hospitals using AI, machine learning, and more to reduce the exposure time for doctors and nurses to affected patients. In Panama, the government leveraged different technologies to rapidly distribute food vouchers to Panamanian citizens, only Panamanian citizens, to be able to not only reduce fraud that could occur, but to help uh, procure groceries locally, spurring on the struggling small business community. But it hasn't just been citizen services that we've seen the efforts over this past year increase in governments acting like startups. In Chile, the Piñera administration, <clears throat> with help from others, including the U.S. State Department, OAS, and others, are investing in the future workforce. And remember, you know, competition doesn't know borders. And they've been investing in programs like the Aid of the U.S. Educate, Academy, Restart, and more have a growing workforce of cloud-enabled skilled professions to face the challenges of what it's going to face tomorrow. That competitiveness continues to be driven. And if we think about back in <clears throat> Colombia, ICSIS, the government's testing arm, it is using machine learning and AI to ensure the fidelity of remote test, uh, test taking occurs. Really pretty cool, uh, cutting edge technology but it contributes to building the right talent longer term for the country to be competitive in a global market. Okay. El Salvador, who we, we heard uh, earlier, made similar investments in the future. We're honored to be a part of their programs as well as other speakers that we've heard today. As we are literally helping train thousands of students and those that have been displaced out of work due to the pandemic on computer skills so that countries can be competitive in this digital age. Now I could go on <clears throat> on exciting, inspiring stories throughout the region where we've been engaged, evidence again of governments acting like startups, universities, healthcare organizations, small businesses changing now because of uh, COVID-19 and accelerating the digital transformation. But that effort absolutely needs guidance and best practices, best practices, for instance, are part of a session tomorrow uh, focused on digital transformation and the role reactivating the economy and employment in Latin America and Caribbean post COVID-19. Strong encouragement for all attendees to join that session and the materials that will be presented. Related in, in preparation for the Summit of the Americas, uh, ABD has been drafting some very strong policy recommend recommendations to heads of state. Now we and other participants are working together with uh, ABD to update these policy recommendations, especially the chapters regarding digital economy, comments that were originally uh, submitted a number of years ago. We continue to encourage uh, ABD and other organizations to be proactive with their recommendations. Now, while there are many in there on how organizations can remain competitive in this new world that we are all living, I focus on a couple of top three. One is governments need to continue to clearly and very comprehensively define essential infrastructure of cutting across industries, goods, services, and workers. This is especially in, in, implicated in the digital infrastructure. We live in a mobile age of <clears throat> technology and especially in the citizens. For instance, in Brazil, greater than 50% of the populace is under 24 years of age and their primary communication vehicle is usually the, their cell phone. The second is the encouragement that governments continue to work on the international trade and investment flows just to make sure that we have uninterrupted and to protect and strengthen the global supply chains that are really critical right now for continued delivery of essential goods, services, and of course, food. This is especially critical, as one can imagine, with PPE, and as uh, the vaccines continue to accelerate uh, being available throughout the region. And last but not least, is really governments, we are seeing accelerate their digital transformation and ensure that public administration continues to innovate just as rapidly 
And this includes uh, within, for instance, statute changes on very complex topics of privacy, uh, as well as artificial intelligence use and more. So that we can enable remote workers to continue to contribute to whatever industry that they are employed about. Where we can have business operations continue to accelerate, really removing the reliance on paper, promoting the, the use of digital technologies across transactions and procedures. This includes, for instance, digital signatures and having the security wrapped around all of those to make sure that the government continues to advance on its primary responsibility of protecting their citizens. Now, the time has come together for, for us to all continue to pull together. As governments collaborate with the private sector, we look forward to continuing our investment and our focus throughout the region. And the private sector has a unique opportunity to help governments <clears throat> respond, support the testing, and continue to pursue effective vaccinations and treatment alternatives. And then, of course, in the short term, we're going to in the medium term, are going to need to be fiscal policies enacted to support these economic activities. We at Amazon are optimistic that this collaboration can deliver today a brighter tomorrow. So looking forward to the ongoing dialogue and the journey that all of us have ahead of us. Thank you. Muchas gracias por sus palabras al señor Jeff Gratz. Le ofrecemos ahora la palabra al señor Gabriel Galván, presidente regional para América Latina y Canadá de Novartis. Bienvenido. Well, ministers and colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to address this important meeting and to briefly discuss the role that innovation-driven business development and entrepreneurs will play in addressing the pandemic and supporting our region's recovery. Up until recently, Latin America saw gains in equality. Unfortunately, the pandemic could undo years of progress. This may be especially, especially pronounced when it comes to health inequalities, where we could see the gap grow even larger between those who have access to care, including advances in treatment, and those who do not. So today, I, I will speak to you about efforts to harness technology to shape and improve the standard of care during the pandemic and beyond. The American Competitiveness Forum has always been a critical channel to facilitate communication and collaboration, and it is even more essential in these challenging times. If we are, are to address roadblocks to innovation and expand access to care, it will take partnership between the private sector and companies like Novartis, as well as the public sector and entrepreneurs. One of the lessons learned this year is that success now and in the future will depend on a more expansive and inclusive view of healthcare stakeholders beyond our traditional customer targets and innovative access models to help get medicines and treatments to more patients more quickly. We cannot and we should not be uh, alone. So it is our hope that we can work with you, the government, public sector, and also the startup community to bring science to patients in a way that is equally innovative as the science itself. So to make that happen, we will both entrepreneurial partners who are also willing to reimagine the way things are done. And we need policies that, to remove the barriers to innovation, to facilitate collaboration between stakeholders and take up um, new approaches and technologies. So I would like to share with you an example of just such a collaboration, Biome, and what is Biome, aims to bring together and empower emerging tech companies and people who are passionate about disrupting healthcare through data and digital technologies to have impact at scale. Novartis Biome was launched back in October 2018, and we're scaling globally to locations uh, you know, such as uh, United Kingdom, France, India, and Canada, as well as Singapore and Brazil in the near future. In Canada, the Biome Home will offer a state-of-the-art workspace, mentorship, and resources to start ops with specific therapeutic offerings. The Biome will be headquartered at Mila, the Montreal Artificial Intelligence Research Institute, where startups and entrepreneurs who will become partners with the Biome will start having access to Novartis Canada team, so ideas can be converted quickly into solutions to patients. Recognizing the momentum to, for innovative digital solutions is here and now, 
partners will have available to them the growing network of Novartis Digital Innovation Hubs in global centers, as well as resources to scale up ideas as fast as possible to help patients and healthcare providers in Canada and around the world. We encourage the OAS through America's Competitiveness Forum to continue its leading role in facilitating such a partnering and fostering innovative approaches that address challenges and opportunities in the region. We very much look forward to continued engagement in this important committee. Thank you. Muchas gracias por sus palabras al señor Galván. Le damos la hora, la bienvenida y la palabra al señor Leo Wisman de la empresa Merx, representada por su jefe de terminales. Muy bienvenido, señor Leo Wisman. Lo escuchamos. Thank you very much, and I have prepared a small presentation for uh, for yourselves. We very much are proud to be able to be part of this. Uh, this forum and share with you our passion for world trade. Uh, AP Moller Mask um, is involved with 20% of world trade. Um, and in Latin America, actually, it percentage is a little bit higher because we have quite a vast footprint in Latin America. Um, we have more than 8,000 people employed. We have uh, four shipping line brands in the in the in the operation in Latin America. Maybe the next slide would help. And we have 8,000 people. And when COVID hit us, and it hit us all about 12 months ago, I still vividly remember when it hit us and we were um, shaken. And the immediate shock was that we had to have a number of priorities clear. And as a group, we fairly quickly said, First priority is to keep our more than 8,000 people working on vessels, on the ports, and in the offices safe. That immediately also was a priority to work with the communities locally in all the Latin American countries to help us deal with this COVID pandemic. And thirdly, we worked with the authorities, and I compliment all the, all the authorities in all the countries, that together we said is we need to keep world trade flowing. We need to make sure the vessels can come in, the goods can move, the truckers can come in, and the terminals can operate. And next slide. And we have a passion to connect and simplify global supply chains. It is incredibly difficult for your exporters and importers in your country to move goods simply from their factory to a place outside in the world. There are so many parties involved. There's so many documents involved, sometimes hundreds of documents. And the cost of moving those goods is quite considerable and complex. And we have a passion and more parties in the industry to finally use technology to make the movement of goods as simple as booking a hotel on one of the web services. Next. So just for your benefit, a number of considerations for a post-COVID-19 recovery. And I do pray every day that that time is very near for the countries in Latin America, because we need to get rid of and we need to conquer this pandemic. But the first thing is that we have a digital technology, which accelerated last year, we had no other option. And I compliment all the authorities and for all the customs authorities who have seen that also is, we need to embrace technology. It allowed us to accelerate a lot of thinking. And with that digital technology, we are liberating our small and medium customers, exporters, importers across the world. Finally, there is democracy in moving goods in the world trade. Technology has made that possible. The other aspect which you need to take into account is that the demand volatility in world trade has been very, very erratic. From a collapse in second quarter last year to an unprecedented boom as 
everybody in, let, in the whole world was ordering different goods. We have seen the flow of physical goods, which are used for the consumers, explode to a level that currently world trade, world containerized trade is not able to cope with the demand at this moment based on their containers and their vessels. Minutos, for the favor. first time since a long time, the world fleet is fully used. And then I come to a third point, and that is the opportunity for each of the countries in Latin America. And something I really think needs much more priority is that nearshoring is the opportunity for Latin America. You have to embark on that and make your exporters and importers part of the nearshoring for the big consumer markets in the world. And the last point, it is still relatively a high cost for our exporters and importers to move their goods on world trade. The export and import dwell times, which is representative of a high cost, is significantly higher in Latin America than anywhere else in the world. The digital connectivity is also a very, very important point. And it doesn't work very well if you only have your little part in your country digitally connected. You need to look at the end-to-end. -end. It must be possible digitally to have full visibility when you move a good from the middle of Latin America to either the middle of Asia, Europe, or the United States. That is the ambition we all need to embrace. That needs us to share our respective uh, initiatives to make sure that ultimately the end-to-end -end movement of the goods is very easy and simple for also the small and medium-sized enterprises. Next. And here I just would like to uh, highlight a particular um, approach we have together done with IBM. It's an open source. So that's the, the good, it's the TradeLens ecosystem, which actually quite a few of the customs authorities in Latin America are having a very close look if this is the digital platform, which is open source, that can really accelerate that digital transformation. And I compliment uh, especially uh, the customs authorities in Chile for being quite advanced in this, but I also know that in Costa Rica, in Panama and Peru, they are actively looking at this particular system. And there are quite a few worldwide customs authorities who are getting access to this particular system. Tiempo cumplido, por favor. So that is, I think, an opportunity. And we are more than happy to use this to digitally transform the world trade in your respective countries. Next. And then. This is something which, eh, if we would all talk to our children, that we need to have an ambition which is environmentally challenging. And we need to decarbonize shipping. We need to decarbonize the movement of goods worldwide. That needs entire different technologies. And we are playing a role, but fortunately, many other Shipping companies and suppliers in engines and in fuels are trying to embrace this opportunity, which we have to realize. And we have said ourselves that by 2030, we have the first carbon neutral vessel, carbon neutral vessel deployed in our network. And hopefully we can anticipate that by up to five to seven years, because actually we are now working on on launching the first vessel in 2023. Completely experimental, entrepreneurial. We have to create a new ecosystem, but that must be a priority. And I really think that Latin America should be part of it. Because we're ultimately, technology goes so fast that by 2050, we must, and I repeat, we must decarbonize shipping. And it is technically possible. It just needs everybody to share hand in hand to make sure that this is our future and this is what we can leave behind for our children. So to, to conclude, what is the challenge? Digital transformation, which I have heard 
is what we have in common. And we need to look at an end-to-end -end solution for making our exporters and importers able to compete. And Latin America is not leading the world. If I look at developments in other parts of the world, they are ahead. So we must make sure that the Latin America exporters and importers, small, medium-sized enterprises, can participate competitively versus what we see in the rest of the world. Tiempo cumplido, por favor. And I'm, thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to share these views, and uh, I, I wish you all a very good forum. Thank you. Muchas gracias por sus palabras al señor Leo Huisman. Continuamos ahora de la Asociación IATA, Asociación Internacional de Transporte Aéreo, su vicepresidente regional para las Américas. Bienvenido, Peter Cerdá. Lo escuchamos. Muchas gracias. Eh, buenos días, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my uh, sincere pleasure to be here this morning. And on behalf of IATA, the International Air Transport Association, and our 290 member airlines, um, I would like to thank the Organization of American States for this kind of invitation in today's forum and to address this group on air transport and our connectivity to the region. Uh, next, please. The, uh, co uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, has had a, a devastating effect on the Americas in terms of connectivity. Uh, aviation fulfilled an essential role in the social economic development of this region. Unlike other continents, such as Europe or North America, we don't have any viable uh, modes of, of transportation that can provide the essential connectivity for both people and goods. As you can see here, uh, in North America, we've lost almost 2,000 city pairs from April 2019 to April 2020. In Latin America, we lost over 1,000 points of connectivity. Uh, places. Perdimos el audio. Si puede, por favor, recuperar el audio. Yeah. Gracias. Okay. Uh, and as um, over the last months, we've seen uh, an improvement on uh, some connectivity coming back to the region. We are still very far from the point where we were in 2019. And that connectivity may take several years to come. And in some cases, that connectivity will not return at all. Next, please. The impact on the jobs and GDP supported by air transport is even more concerning for us. In North America, up to now, we lost approximately 4.3 million jobs and over $5 million billion in GDP. In the Latin America region, we lost over 3.9 million jobs and over $900 million billion in GDP. All the economies uh, in the region are reliant on tourism and foreign trade. There's not one country in this region, in, in our region, that is not dependent on air transportation in one manner or another. Agriculture and fisheries need air cargo to export the perishable goods to consumers all around the world. Without aviation, tourists will not be able to explore the islands of the Caribbean or visit the historical sites of Machu Picchu or visit the rainforest of Costa Rica. We understand that managing the public health crisis is currently the number one priority of our government. But the longer uh, aviation in the Americas rest uh, remains restricted, the more precarious the situation will become, not just for the airline industry, but for all the businesses that depend on efficient connectivity. The many airlines in the regions were already struggling in in before 2019. Uh, next, please. But when you see now the current situation for the, carry, the airlines in our region, our region is the one that's suffering more than any. The crisis as the region is no surprise to many. This is a very expensive region to operate. Our, my colleague from the shipping um, uh, just gave the example how expensive it is 
for them to, to operate in Latin America. It's no different from us in the air transport. This is a region with high taxes, charges, old infrastructure, and more importantly, outdated competitive regulatory policies. And the number of airlines who are either, either going bankrupt or entering the financial restructuring has been the hardest in Latin America, as you can see by the slide. This will affect your recovery. This will affect your country's recovery and the connectivity of our region to the rest of the world. There's no doubt about that, unless we're able to implement change in the next several uh, months to come. Next slide, please. And further to create the perfect storm, what we're, we're experiencing, the industry recovery will be weaker than we expected due to the restricted policies responses that the new vari various variants around the world are occurring. More countries are implemented restricting restrictions today than we did in the last five to six months. We know from the experience in January and the booking data from February and March, the first and second quarters of this year will be slower in recovery. And if we look at the different scenarios in the slides, where governments are cautious to relax these travel restrictions, will only re, re, uh, achieve a 46% of the 2019 travel levels by the end of this year. So it's going to be a slight improvement to what we had last year. And we don't expect the full recovery of international traffic to recover, to come back until around 2019, to 2019 levels before 2024. And some specialists are now saying that could prolong into 2025. And we are a region that depends on intra-regional and global connectivity. While I certainly would like to be more positive, this is a reality that our industry and the travel and tour tourism sector is facing. And if we go to the next slide, please. And, and despite the impact that COVID has had, Airlines have made unprecedented efforts to help people and countries wherever they can. We've taken the responsibility to support the region's effort to fight the global pandemic. Airlines have flown in this region nearly 5.4 million people back home on special flights after borders were closed last March. And we've flown nearly 1.5 million tons of cargo, and most of this has been medical equipment such as face masks or respirators. And we provided millions of free tickets to healthcare workers so they can move from one country or from one city to another. And today, our number one priority is that we play a, a global and critical role in delivering the vaccines to all the countries across the Americas, which is the ultimate light at the end of our tunnel. And this task is monumental. Just providing a single dose of the vaccine to 7.8 billion people would require 8,747 aircraft to do this. I want to also reiterate, and I've done this in, in past forums that I participated here in the OAS, this industry, our industry, air transport, has been at your side throughout the crisis. So I respectfully urge you to partner with IATA and the industry and our airlines to work together to utilize aviation to drive the region's economic recovery from COVID-19 and make air transportation the region more competitive in the future. And if you go to the last slide, next slide, please. But with any crisis, what we need to look for is the opportunities opportunity to reflect on the past and see what can be improved for the future. In terms of the short term to drive the regions and the air transport sector recovery from COVID-19, we urge you to follow the CART takeoff guidance. Over 30% of the countries in this region still have some form of quarantine measures in place, which simply destroy any return of demand or recovery efforts. When we look at other countries still having policies that go against the global best practices, such as testing for crude or testing on even domestic flights, 
this goes against global best practices that are being re, uh, suggested by ICAO or the World Health Organization. Airlines have put strict biosafety protocols as well as airports in place that have proven to be effective and air travel is not a meaningful vector of spreading the virus. We're also asking and urging to accept the electronic and globally aligned health credentials such as the IATA travel pass, which Panama was the first government in the world to commit to, to do a trial with Copa Airlines. We will continue to call on our governments in the region to provide the financial lease to the sector to ensure that more airlines do not go bankrupt or need to reorganize under chapter 11. And finally, we urge you to help us create a detailed vaccination rollout plan that will allow and specify the lifting of international restrictions as more of your respective citizens are vaccinated. Post-crisis, we must must address the region's serious shortcomings to make air transport more competitive on a global stage. Latin America is simply not a competitive region. Accepting the conditions of 2019 may be acceptable in Europe, may be acceptable in Asia or in North America. It is not acceptable in Latin America as governments have viewed aviation as an easy cash cow. I urge you to help with your governments to invest in the needed adequate infrastructure, both on the ground and in the air. We need to implement modern regulatory best practices to compete globally, including consistent and fair passenger right regulations. We need to reduce air aviation related taxes and charges. We need to look at the environmental component as my colleague in the shipping business has said we have a responsibility to our environment. We need our countries in the region to do more of that. And finally, we need to work together to ensure aviation is viewed as your business partner, supporting the social economic development of the region, making air transport in the Americas more competitive. We do hope that we will rebuild our industry. The current spirit of cooperation of governments in the region will allow us for the removal of roadblocks that have in the past stifled and successful development of this sector, often hindered for the provisions of good passenger experience. So I wanna end and thank you again to the OAS. With every crisis, we have to look at opportunities. There is no region that has more potential to change for the better than this region, but only if governments acknowledge and support air transport's fundamental role in the social and economic well-being of the country's development. If we're able to successfully partner with you, the governments, in the next several years on a common agenda, the regional will benefit tremendously by doubling of passenger traffic and more global, regional, and domestic connectivity than ever before. So please count on IATA support of the airline support with this opportunity before us and ensure that the future of this industry can be healthy to help our governments with the recovery of the economic and social uh, recovery plans. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias al señor Peter Cerda. Continuamos ahora y le damos la bienvenida al señor Alejandro Anderlich, director de relaciones gubernamentales para Latinoamérica de la empresa Salesforce. Bienvenido, lo escuchamos. Muchas gracias, Martina. Qué bueno verte. Eh, queridos latinoamericanos, eh, muy buenos días. Eh, estoy muy honrado de compartir eh, estas palabras con eh, los distinguidos colegas de, de empresas y los distinguidos representantes de gobierno. Pero yo no quiero que esto sea compartir palabras, quiero que esto sea que nos pongamos a actuar. Quiero traerles un llamado urgente a la acción. Eh, los libros de historia nos van a reconocer en unos años como los claros protagonistas de este momento increíble de cuarta revolución industrial más pandemia y la historia nos va a juzgar por las medidas que tomamos para eh, promover el desarrollo de nuestra región en este momento tan especial. Porque si bien es cierto que desde el año pasado la región atravesó múltiples crisis, 
creo que no quedó ninguna pendiente. Lo cierto es que la región, nuestra querida Latinoamérica, está desafiada desde muchísimo antes. ¿Cómo podemos lograr entre todos para que de una vez cada latinoamericano tenga dignidad? Cada latinoamericano pueda ejercer y llevar a cabo el futuro con el que sueña. Entonces yo les vengo a proponer a todos que actuemos y que actuemos juntos y que actuemos juntos ahora. Este momento tan especial nos exige un liderazgo colaborativo. No podemos seguir eh, liderando en silos. Tenemos que darnos la mano sector público, sector privado, organismos, todos, para poder encontrar una solución a este momento tan particular que estamos viviendo y que todos detectamos tan claramente. Y si bien hemos podido comprobar este último año qué gran aliado fue para todos nosotros la tecnología para permitirnos comunicarnos mejor, trabajar mejor, estudiar mejor, creo que ahora el gran desafío es cómo hacemos para que los beneficios de la tecnología sean accesibles absolutamente a todos los ciudadanos latinoamericanos que la tecnología pueda ser usada como una herramienta que promueva el bien y el progreso, y para que muchas más personas sean a la vez que usuarios entusiastas de tecnología, también creadores de tecnología. Necesitamos mucha más gente que pueda crear tecnología. Y en ese sentido hago un llamado muy especial a que actuemos juntos ahora, sector público y privado, en particular en tres líneas de acción muy, muy concretas. Educación y empleo, la primera. La segunda, promoción del, del ecosistema de pymes y emprendedores. Y la tercera, eh, la recuperación y el saneamiento de nuestro querido planeta, de nuestra casa común que, que hemos eh, vapuleado por tanto tiempo. Entonces, yo invito a todas las compañías de tecnología en particular en cuanto a educación y empleo, a que ya que hace tanto tiempo que venimos quejándonos de la falta de recursos calificados en la industria, hagamos un pool entre todas las que tenemos programas gratuitos de enseñanza y capacitación, los pongamos a disposición de los gobiernos y trabajemos junto con los gobiernos y nuestros ecosistemas para capacitar y certificar a muchos más ciudadanos y ayudarlos una vez que estén certificados a incorporarse dentro del mundo del trabajo. IDC está pronosticando que el ecosistema Salesforce eh, hasta el año 2024 va a crear solo en Latinoamérica 300.000 empleos directos. Y si llevamos eso a nivel mundial, más de 4 millones de nuevos empleos. Y así como nosotros tenemos estas predicciones eh, eh, tan promisorias, eh, el resto de las compañías del ecosistema tienen eh, perspectivas similares de crecimiento. Entonces pongámonos a actuar ya poniendo nuestros programas a disposición eh, para poder generar ese círculo virtuoso de capacitación, eh, generación de oportunidades y luego incorporación al ecosistema de trabajo. Lo mismo para el tema de desarrollo del ecosistema de pymes y emprendedores. Escuchamos hablar de ciertas iniciativas eh, en representantes de gobierno sobre programas pilotos que están llevándose a cabo con pymes. Pero ¿por qué no todas las compañías de tecnología que tenemos herramientas para potenciar el desarrollo de las pymes pensamos en un programa eh, eh, a escala eh, sustentable eh, y, e inclusivo, de manera tal que pongamos todos nuestros recursos tecnológicos en beneficio de las pymes con programas preferenciales para poder llevar eh, realmente a las pymes ese siguiente nivel que necesitan y para el cual la tecnología puede ser un muy fuerte habilitador. Un minuto, y lo mismo favor. para el desarrollo del planeta. Ya estoy terminando. Eh, eh, creo que también podemos unirnos para resolver estas cuestiones eh, tan cruciales que tiene la protección eh, de nuestro planeta. Eh, creo yo que, como dice nuestro eh, CEO y, y Chair Mark Benioff, eh, business is the greatest platform for change. Entonces creo que tenemos la obligación de eh, empezar a ser mucho más relevantes y por favor actuemos juntos ahora. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por sus palabras al señor Alejandro Anderlich. Continuamos ahora y solicitamos la presentación del vicepresidente ejecutivo del suministro global de Walmart, el señor Richard Mayfield. Le escuchamos. Good morning and thank you very much for inviting us and giving me this time to speak to you. Um, I'm going to be brief and I'm going to be very specific. 
Um, what I would like to push for is to encourage all of you to make digitization of the licensing and permitting processes facilitating construction a key priority in 2021. Why do I think it's now it's so important? Three reasons. Firstly, if we can improve that process and speed it up by digitizing it, we facilitate the growth of employment and economic growth that we so need to recover from the post-COVID world. Second, in a remote working environment that we now find ourselves, digitization is both easier and more necessary. And third, the US government has made it very clear that rule of law projects is a, are a top priority in the region and that it will invest significantly in foreign aid to help fund projects like this one. To give you one example, last year uh, in, in Mexico, we opened less than half the stores we normally do, partly because paper-based processes slowed down to such an extent. What are the benefits that these changes would begin? Well, it benefits a wide range of stakeholders. Firstly, there's all the people that use the systems. That's companies large and small. That's the housing market. It's construction sector professionals. Secondly, we'd significantly benefit underserved communities from the economic growth that would follow. And thirdly, governments and public servants will gain through both competitiveness and transparency. We've done a lot of work with the Inter-American Development Bank and with OAS REAC, um, with, a, with a private sector working group that we chair. And we put together five very clear digital licensing and permitting reforms. Things like having the process online, tracking the process online, payments and renewals online, as well as training and certification for government officials within the process. Why is the ACF so important in this? Well, simply, you're the perfect set of officials to take the lead because the OAS has been a leader in developing the best practices, as I just mentioned. And secondly, because your heads of state made this a priority in the 2018 Summit of America's declaration. And so strong implementa implementation efforts this year will position your heads of state to highlight the successes later this year, at the Summit of Americas. Some countries are already moving forward on implementing elements, but we need robust and comprehensive implementation across the whole region. We're happy to support with all the technical assistance that's required. And I, so I encourage all of you as ministers and the summit planners to seize this opportunity this year to really help us accelerate economic growth and recovery. Thank you. Muchas gracias por sus palabras y le damos la bienvenida a Gunamu Puri, fundador, CEO y presidente de Biopress and Indies Pharma. Muy bienvenido, señor Mupuri, lo escuchamos. Very pleasant morning and greetings from the land of sunshine, Jamaica, uh, to the, the distinguished members of OAS, the participants and the guest speakers, and also the President and Secretary General of OAS. I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me to this forum. And also, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this group I would consider as a think tank group. Uh, from the private sector, Bioprist uh, in Jamaica is a conglomerate of uh, companies spanning its footprint into pharmaceuticals, developing special economic zones for BPO industries, now escalating to knowledge processing industry, and also we're into healthcare sector uh, as well. So this is Myself as a physician, uh, this is what I would like to say. The ongoing novel coronavirus pandemic has caused an irreparable and a devastating effect on human resources, especially the frontline workers, and most importantly, from my perspective, the healthcare professionals on the functional infrastructure of the healthcare all over the world. The direct impact of COVID-19 has recorded an unforeseen demand for a disruptive and an innovative medical and healthcare infrastructure in every nation to safeguard its future generation and the mankind from any further unforeseen healthcare calamities. 
the rapidly increasing aging population, acute and chronic illnesses, nearshore nature of Jamaica commands and demands a comprehensive world-class quality and increase in medical and healthcare services. The commission in immediate short order, not only Jamaica by extension to the entire region. The initiative is propelled by the Think Out of the Box entrepreneurial family and intuition driven founders of the Biopis Group to deliver another impressive and innovative and a comprehensive par excellence solution encompassing the never existed medical tourism product in the form and shape of our new initiative, Granite Med City, to be built on 65 acres in Montague Bay, Jamaica, which will be driven by intuition, innovation, and excellence. The distinct geographical advantage Jamaica has with its relatively hurricane proof and firewalling from other weather related calamities placed our country in a strategic spot and a choice for building medical tourism concept in this part of Northern Caribbean. The other country's enormous availability of the local feedstock of population, stalwarts in the medical and healthcare professions, technically technology backed with human resources, country's modern infrastructure, vibrant hospitality sector, labor force, and near shows to the United States with an extraordinary logistical advantage, both by air and sea connectivity. Not to forget about the key component of this country is the regulatory framework the country has drafted to invite the investments into this country, along with the physical incentives policies, in addition to the vibrant stock exchange, which has been consistently the number one stock exchange until the COVID pandemic has hit us. All this has put us in a very strategic location and also it has made a compulsory, I mean, compelling case for us to build the medical tourism concept in Montague Bay, Jamaica. We are currently finding an opportunity out of this crisis so that we are well prepared going forward from this crisis. I believe uh, I consider this as a pilot project that we are doing it in Jamaica and we are not limited to Jamaica and we are willing to extend to our regional brothers and sisters so that if this makes sense, we can replicate this model so that we can provide an alternative mechanism for our North American neighbors, particularly the COVID has ransacked the entire healthcare system in North America. The insurance companies have gone bankrupt. If our region can offer healthcare support to our North American nations, it will reduce the cost factor for the ailing nations. So it will allow them to revive from the pandemic crisis. It will also assist the regional, the Latin region, Caribbean and Latin region to create an alternative economy until our traditional economies will rebound back which I predict based on the studies, based on the reports I see, we are looking at 2024-2025 to be where we were before. Not only that, we as a company were also... Eso, sino que como compañía, nosotros significativa... Indianously developed vaccine out of India for COVID. When that comes, when we get WHO approvals, it will be definitely game-changing um, factor for not only for Jamaica but the entire Caribbean and by extension we can uh, consider LATAM to be the beneficiaries of this vaccine initiative through the private sector bodies. So having said that we are now investing almost 315 million US dollars being poured into 1.2 million square foot of construction in Montego Bay which will be factoring everything, designing, building to suit, operate and promote this medical and healthcare initiative and a wellness focused special academic zone initiative just four miles away from Sangsun International Airport in Montego Bay. Tiempo cumplido, por favor. Having said that, this is the time for the think tank to look at all the possibilities and endless possibilities that we as a region can foster or we can 
draft a, a framework that can be applied across the region where we, we are going to remain competitive. This will be a great initiative from my perspective to recoup and rejuvenate ourselves from this pandemic crisis. And this is our post COVID initiative. Having said that, we as a country, Jamaica is open for discussions, investments, not only for Jamaica, as I said to you, by extension to the entire region. So is there anything that we can do from our government's perspective and the private sector perspective? We'll be more than happy to participate and impart our knowledge and intellectual property to the region. So I really thank you for giving this uh, incredible opportunity to speak at this forum. Um, let's continue our initiatives so that we can secure the, the planet's richest resources, that's human life. So with that said, I would like to wish you, all of you to keep safe and well until we're out of this, while we can strategize initiatives so that we can secure our economies together. Together, we are much stronger. I really thank you, all of you once again for this participation. Thank you. Muchas gracias por sus palabras al señor Mupuri. Conforme a la agenda y para dar comienzo al diálogo, ofrecerá su intervención la Secretaría Ejecutiva para el Desarrollo Integral de la OEA, Kim Osborn. Bienvenida. Thank you so much, distinguished ministers and representatives of member states, ambassadors, senior private sector executives. Um, before we get into the dialogue, we'd just like to preface the dialogue as a secretariat with a few comments. Allow me to begin by expressing my thanks to the private sector executives for taking the time from their busy schedules to join us this morning. Your participation is in this event is evidence of your commitment to the development of this hemisphere. And we are grateful for each of you for sharing your unique perspectives with us in this dialogue. Our discussion today has reaffirmed the need for continued informed private public engagement to better define roles and contributions and to pursue areas of mutual interest as we collectively work towards the economic re recovery of the region. Continuing engagement with the private sector has been a feature of the OAS for many decades and has been formalized as an integral part of the meetings of various organs of the OAS, including the General Assembly and meetings of ministers and high level authorities on various things. Today's discussions and others that we have engaged in since the pandemic confirm that even as we speak of building back better, we must acknowledge that in fiscal terms, the money spent on the COVID-19 response has increased the debt burden of governments across the region and require them to cut budgets and potentially postpone critical public investment. The real impact is the limited state capacity to advance development and to re respond to the citizenry's needs. Importantly too, the support that governments would normally provide to private sector to, to support private sector investment would be reduced. Therefore, as we think of our development strategies and prepare to take the bold and innovative steps to boost productivity, human capital and sustainability, we must also strengthen national, regional and global alliances and cooperation mechanisms that include all sectors and actors within the society. The private sector is in this sensible to the achievement of this peculiar task. In alignment with the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals, equality and equity must be at the center of our efforts to improve health systems, education, labor, employment and infrastructure in member states to ensure that vulnerable and underserved populations such as youth, women, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, Afro-descendants and other minorities, as well as informal and less educated workers are not left behind. This remit is beyond the capacity of any government acting alone. 
the private sector has a vested interest in supporting this initiative as invariably it is a prime beneficiary of the investment in these areas. Similarly, what we have known for a long time, but has become even more evident from the pandemic, is that we must pay particular attention to the micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises that form the backbone of our region's economy. The next normal will impose additional burdens on our small businesses to adapt through the adoption of new business models and by accelerating the adoption of new technologies. They must do so at greater relative cost with less working capital, human resources, and access to technology than their larger counterparts. It is imperative, therefore, that larger companies make every effort to include MSMEs in global supply chains. If we are to realize the bottom-up sustainable growth that the region demands, collaboration and innovation across the economy are required to provide financing, restore demand, build resilient supply chains, and generally improve small businesses' capability and resilience. The Executive Secretariat for Integral Development, which I have the honor to, re to lead in its role as the development arm of the organization, has repositioned existing programs and initiatives and developed new ones to meet the emergent needs of member states. This work has been supported by development and optimization of strategic partnerships that are being leveraged and expanded to respond to the crisis. The Inter-American Competitiveness Network, the REACT, serves as a regional platform for actionable collaboration. As an experienced, honest broker, we've demonstrated success in integrated development in the Americas. We stand ready to support the creation of partnerships that build synergies from the unique skills and resources that each partner brings, amplifies effectiveness, and accelerates progress towards sustainable development in the region, while at the same time bringing value to our partners. Colleagues, dialogue on its own, while valuable, is not sufficient. We therefore invite you to join us in our quest to transform dialogue at the highest levels of government into concrete and impactful actions that can bring about meaningful change within our member states. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this pivotal moment of accelerated change has in created an imperative to consider the choices we will face when the constraints of the pandemic are removed. Will we return to business as usual with the attendant weaknesses? Or will we endeavor to build the kind of hemisphere we want and that the COVID experience has shown us that we need? How will we move from the old normal to a new normal, marked by development with equity? While every country, institution, or business will face its own set of challenges and opportunities in moving forward, we must not lose sight of the fact that we are on this journey together, because in an ever increasingly interconnected and interdependent world, our prospects for success are inextricably linked as our prospects for failure. While the private sector will continue to be the engine for job creation, innovation, and accelerants for economic growth, governments drive to implement stable and solid supportive ecosystems remains of critical importance. Our destination is clear. We must make sustainable, inclusive development our common goal. This requires the participation of a multitude of actors. I invite all our private sector guests, as well as our member states, to consider how we may harness the energy and the opportunities presented to us at this time in our history, to reimagine, rethink, and reconstruct a public-private compact that will truly propel our region forward. We can and we must work together. The future of this region depends on it. And with that, I look forward to the dialogue with the private sector. Thank you. 
Muchas gracias por sus palabras a la secretaria Kim Osborne. Para moderar la sesión de preguntas y respuestas, pedimos a la presidencia de la RIAC a través del viceministro Daniel Legarda que pueda, por favor, tomar la palabra para moderar esta sesión. Viceministro, bienvenido. Liberar el micrófono, por favor, que no lo podemos escuchar. ¿Me escuchan bien ahí? Perfecto, ¿Me escuchan gracias. ahí? Perfecto, gracias. Decía, muchas gracias a todos los panelistas y gracias en particular a la secretaria Kim Osborne por sus palabras y su llamado a la acción dentro de este, esta coyuntura. Vamos a abrir la mesa para preguntas de las autoridades, igualmente para los representantes del sector privado que todavía nos acompañan. Hemos escuchado con atención cada uno de los planteamientos que se han realizado por la diversidad de los sectores y las tareas de la recuperación económica, está claro que hay varios temas importantes y varias dudas que surgirían para considerar. Pero les vamos a pedir eh, que seamos breves en las preguntas para poder contar con intervenciones de las diferentes delegaciones y las respuestas de los diferentes representantes, eh, ya sea del sector privado o de las delegaciones en particular. Les pedimos solicitar la palabra con el nombre de la delegación igualmente en el chat y creo que ya se había registrado una primera eh, pregunta por parte de la delegación de Brasil. Así es que con el apoyo de la Secretaría de OREAC, pues damos paso a estas preguntas. Eh, en este caso con la delegación de Brasil, por favor, um, adelante. Excelentísimo señor presidente de la República de Ecuador, Lenín Moreno. Excelentíssimo senhor secretário-geral da Organização dos Estados Americanos, Luiz Almagro. Excelentíssimo senhor ministro da Produção, Comércio Exterior, Investimento e Pesca do Equador, Ivan Fernando Montaneda Peru. Senhor secretário especial de Produtividade, Emprego e Competitividade do Ministério da Economia do Brasil, senhor Carlos da Costa, gostaria de saudar e desejar boa tarde a todos os participantes desse importante fórum, a quem me dirijo como presidente da Financiadora de Estudos e Projetos, FINEP. A FINEP é a principal agência federal de apoio à ciência, tecnologia e inovação no Brasil, vinculada ao Ministério da Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovação. Atuamos em toda a cadeia de inovação, desde a pesquisa básica e aplicada até a colocação de inovações no mercado. Temos abrangência em todo o território nacional e apoiamos todos os setores da economia. Dispomos de instrumentos de apoio tanto não reembolsáveis quanto reembolsáveis e também de investimento em fundos e em empresas inovadoras. Os temas escolhidos para esse encontro são de extrema relevância e representam desafios comuns a todos os países das Américas. O tema transformação digital e competitividade de pequenas e médias empresas e cidadania, nossa convicção é de que empresas inovadoras têm maior capacidade e resiliência para enfrentar os desafios. Nesse contexto, a FINEP apoia pequenas e médias empresas, a partir de uma rede de parceiros regionais, para ter os maior capilaridade em todo o território nacional, tanto com financiamentos reembolsáveis quanto não reembolsáveis. Para esse segmento, é muito importante o desenvolvimento e a adoção de tecnologias 4.0, a fim de darmos um salto de produtividade para a nossa economia, principalmente nos setores de agro, saúde indústria e cidades inteligentes. Com relação ao desenvolvimento de negócios baseado na inovação e no empoderamento de empreendedores, a FINEP tem como prioridade a transformação de conhecimento presente nas nossas universidades e instituições de pesquisa e inovações por meio das empresas, percorrendo toda a cadeia de inovação. Para isso, contamos com programas voltados ao desenvolvimento de parques tecnológicos, 
criação de novas empresas a partir de ideias inovadoras e investimento diretamente em startups. Por relação às mudanças climáticas, a FINEP apoia diversas infraestruturas fundamentais para o monitoramento climático, tais como Centro Nacional de Monitoramento e Alerta de Desastres Naturais, a Torre Alta da Amazônia, que é um observatório atmosférico e também é a mais alta estrutura do Hemisfério Sul, o navio de pesquisa hidrocianográfico, Vital de Oliveira, e o navio polar Almirante Maximiliano. Olhando para o futuro, estamos desenvolvendo a bioeconomia, voltada ao uso sustentável de nossa biodiversidade, desenvolvendo em parceria com o Banco Interamericano de Desenvolvimento a implantação da metodologia MRV, de redução de carbono, e estudamos para inseri-la em nossas próximas chamadas para os projetos. Desenvolvendo, em parceria com a Embrapa, pesquisas voltadas ao mapeamento das futuras condições climáticas de cada região para permitir a substituição das culturas agrícolas atuais pelas que serão mais adequadas ao novo cenário. Por fim, com relação à recuperação pós-Covid, seguimos com nossa convicção de que apoiar o desenvolvimento científico e tecnológico é a única estratégia efetiva para a resolução de problemas de escala global, assim como para a retomada da economia mundial. Nesse sentido, a FINEP, com o apoio do governo federal e as orientações do Ministério da Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovações, contribui para a geração de conhecimento, a produção de riquezas e a melhoria de qualidade de vida dos brasileiros. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Gracias a la delegación de Brasil. Eh, no sé si había alguna consulta puntual para alguno de los representantes de las delegaciones o igualmente para alguno de los representantes del sector eh, privado, pero mientras hay alguna solicitud de preguntas en caso que las hubiera, contamos todavía con la presencia de algunos de los representantes del sector privado. Y haría yo algunas preguntas para que puedan ellos libremente consultarnos eh, mientras alguien también se anima para preguntar. En primer lugar, les, les consultaría si pueden identificar, todavía está, vemos que todavía está Guna con nosotros, Eduardo Suárez, Leo Huisman y Alejandro Anderle. Para, para ustedes, ¿podrían identificar cuál consideran la principal oportunidad para la región en los nichos de transformación digital eh, que tiene la región? ¿En qué podemos diferenciarnos y alcanzar un espacio importante a nivel global desde el punto de vista de la, del hemisferio occidental. Y en segundo lugar, eh, hemos escuchado la importancia de las pymes eh, y los retos con su pandemia. ¿Qué lecciones sobre cuáles, qué deberían hacer y qué no deberían hacer las pymes de forma integral eh, y en general podrían ustedes también eh, darnos? Quisiera quedarme con esas dos preguntas para nuestros invitados eh, y por favor siéntanse libres de responderlas. Eh, mientras recibimos más preguntas de las delegaciones. Si puedo responder la... Eduardo, adelante Eduardo, por favor. Thank you. If you want, I can give some perspective on what we have. We think that the, the disruptions we are seeing now from, from new technologies are affecting all sectors. And, and being able to tap these, these opportunities requires us to, to be very open to the adoption of technologies. And I think it's something that affects countries, but it also affects us as companies. And what we're trying to do is to basically open up ourselves to understand how all these technologies can affect basically everything we do. Uh, that includes being able to cross information that we have currently stuck in silos. Uh, it, it includes being able to, to, in a way, reinvent ourselves and the people who work with us uh, to be able to tap this. Uh, and, and this involves uh, basically all the areas where, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, as companies, as, as countries, we have to make very strong efforts to educate our people 
uh, these people have to be um, cognizant that artificial intelligence is going to reinvent the way we see professions. Because in the future, we not only will need to be lawyers and scientists and economists, but we'll need to be that plus a, a very um, proficient in the language of, of, of technology. We will, uh, because more and more the jobs are being automated. And so in, 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 able, in order to be able to tap that, we need to uh, be able to participate in that uh, automation of the services industry, as we saw before in the manufacturing industries. Uh, we also have to be aware that we have to be able to channel resources to where ideas emerge, and that includes a, a digital, a, sorry, financial inclusion. It includes a very strong public education networks because of both of these uh, things allow us uh, to, in a way, play with the law of big numbers. We can't, uh, as countries and as companies, uh, count on the great ideas emerging in in a select few individuals who are born with financial firepower, because ideas can emerge anywhere at, at all sectors. And the more we include all the different elements of our population and our labor forces into having these opportunities, eh, those individuals we will be able to tap their, their abilities, but they will also have the opportunity to develop in a way their dreams. Um, eh, so it has to do with a lot of things. I, I would say the key is education, financial inclusion, um, property rights, respect of contracts, because you have to provide both the incentives and the means for people to develop their ideas and to participate in this new economy. And we have to reinvent the way education is seen because the professional of the future is increasingly somebody who knows the profession, but also how to digitalize that profession. Muchas gracias, Eduardo. Creo gracias. que también uh, comentarnos algo, Alejandro. Anderlich. Alejandro, adelante, por favor. Y también está todavía con nosotros Gabriel Galván. Así es que si tú quieres intervenir también en respuesta a estas preguntas, adelante. Por ahora, Alejandro, querías comentarnos algo, por favor. Sí, muchas gracias. Sobre tu primera pregunta de las oportunidades de la digitalización, yo recuerdo hace unos meses una charla muy interesante entre el expresidente del BID, Luis Alberto Moreno, y Nili Cruz, que fue quien eh, lideró la agenda digital en Europa eh, hace unos años. Y cuando ella comentaba los grandes desafíos que tuvo digitalizar a Europa, eh, habló de un concepto que a mí me quedó muy grabado, que es la voluntad política de abrazar el cambio e ir hacia adelante. Creo que eh, una de las grandes enseñanzas que tuvimos de, del año pasado es cómo la tecnología nos está ayudando a hacer las, la, las cosas mejor, a ser un aliado en eh, 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 función del desarrollo. Con lo cual, eh, retomando las palabras de, de Nili, eh, creo que tenemos que tomar el toro por las astas y que exista verdadero liderazgo político por el lado de los gobiernos y liderazgo por el lado de las organizaciones para realmente promover eh, ese eh, salto tecnológico que todas las organizaciones latinoamericanas necesitan. Y en cuanto a desarrollo de pymes, eh, creo que también pasa por educación. Las pymes probablemente no tienen acceso al conocimiento de eh, qué herramientas tecnológicas pueden usar para potenciar eh, eh, su negocio y su desarrollo. Y ahí creo que es clave, como decía hace un ratito, eh, el trabajo conjunto de gobiernos y sector privado para poder ayudar eh, a las pymes a entender eh, y a confiar en la tecnología y poder eh, eh, transitar juntos ese camino. Eh, educación, educación, educación. Muchas gracias, Alejandro. Coincido con tu criterio. ¿Habría alguna otra respuesta, algún otro comentario? De parte Hola, de... ¿me escuchas? Adelante, sí. Adelante, Hola, Gabriel. Pedro. Muchas gracias, viceministro. Eh, primero que nada, nuevamente, gracias por la oportunidad de poder participar en este foro. Eh, nuevamente, eh, creo que eh, solo nos toca aplaudir los esfuerzos que están realizando para, pues no solo a todos, reconocer que estamos frente a problemas muy complejos, que obviamente pues, requieren, o me parece que la única forma que podemos abordarlos de una forma efectiva, pues es a través de estas colaboraciones. Eh, particularmente en la región, me parece que es evidente la, la inequidad que existe, y, y bueno, me queda absolutamente claro que la iniciativa privada tiene un rol que jugar para poder eh, participar también en esta recuperación 
de nuestra, de nuestra economía. Y regresando, regresando a, al tema digital, eh, realmente eh, a mí me apasiona mucho este tema. Veo, estoy por supuesto en el área de healthcare y veo tremendas oportunidades que podemos tener todavía. Creo fielmente en, en la aplicación o el beneficio que puede traer pues, eh, aplicaciones digitales dentro de lo que son nuestros sistemas de salud en una gama muy importante, ¿no? en un rango muy amplio de necesidades y donde podríamos definitivamente hacer lo mejor. Y creo, creo el, el, llamado, el llamado para, para todos nosotros es cómo podemos efectivamente realizar estas colaboraciones. Yo creo que eh, todos nosotros entendemos la importancia que tienen y quizás donde seguimos batallando es en cómo podemos llevarlas a cabo. Eh, tuve la oportunidad de poder eh, presentarle rápidamente el caso de, de Novartis Bion como un ejemplo, ¿no? como un, un ejemplo práctico de cómo podemos pues empezar a impulsar estas colaboraciones y creo que deberíamos de empezar por lo, más, por lo más básico, que es conectar con el ecosistema que existe en cada uno de nuestros países y facilitar esta interacción, ¿no? poder identificar cuáles son los, los, los partners correctos que nos permitan traer a academia, traer a las compañías de tecnología, traer a, a entrepreneurs, traer a la, a la iniciativa privada y los gobiernos, para que ya con, con, con este diálogo podamos realmente mover adelante las, las grandes retos que tenemos. Eh, bueno, simplemente este, ponernos a, a la orden y decir que nuevamente estamos en la mejor disposición de colaborar con todos ustedes. Muchísimas gracias por tu respuesta, Gabriel, y tus comentarios. ¿Habría algún otro comentario o respuesta? Si no, me gustaría plantear una última pregunta para cerrar este foro, agradeciendo nuevamente por su interés y su participación. Se ha hablado mucho de los impactos del COVID, las oportunidades y lo que tenemos por delante por acelerar en términos de accionar ¿no? en la región, incluso con el llamado a la acción que nos han hecho varios de los panelistas y también la secretaria Kim Osborne. Una pregunta muy breve. ¿Qué lecciones nos deja la pandemia sobre resiliencia? Tenemos en la tarde una sesión que va a hablar sobre la resiliencia en varios sectores a través de la región. Hablamos del sector exportador, del sector de turismo y desde el punto de vista también de la transformación digital. Pero, ¿qué lecciones nos podría dejar la pandemia sobre la resiliencia, um, acudiendo tal vez un poco a estas oportunidades que Alejandro ha mencionado eh, recientemente. ¿Cómo logramos actuar y planear para enfrentar eh, esto en los diferentes ámbitos o desde el ámbito en el que ustedes se desempeñan? Quisiera con esa pregunta cerrar e igualmente dejar el espacio para que ustedes puedan responder, nuestros uh, representantes del sector privado que nos acompañan aquí. Adelante, por favor. No sé si, eh, Eduardo, quieres tú empezarnos a comentar algo sobre este tema de resiliencia, esta última pregunta. O Alejandro, tal vez, Gabriel, eh, Leo, Huseman, igual, si es que quisieras comentar sobre esta última pregunta. O en su defecto, alguien de las delegaciones también. So, allow me uh, to, to respond to this, uh, Leo Huseman. I think what we have learned is that when you are in a crisis, then the crisis has an opportunity where private enterprise and the authorities can work hand in hand to solve problems which got stuck in what I call the system. Um, and we talk so much about digital transformation that is actually still a topic where we should continue to accelerate. And uh, my appeal is to the to the various countries in Latin America is don't reinvent the digital platforms. They are already there. Connect your authorities to the digital platforms and your importers and exporters will be surprised how resilient you are in helping them to really compete on the world stage. So take on that invitation, connect instead of reinvent itself to the digital platforms which are already in place. I think we agree very much with, with Leo. Uh, on this uh, type of shock, I think the, the, 
the, the difficulties the world is going through right now are in many ways an opportunity to accelerate uh, these synergies because at the end of the day, uh, the players in the public and private sectors uh, are on the same team on this. Uh, we are all being affected by a similar shock. We are all uh, dealing with pre-existing shocks, which are uh, learning to live with this new technology. I mean, in many cases, seeing our, our operations disrupted both as countries and, and, as, and, as, um, as, country, uh, and as, as companies, and we have to, to learn to live with this. And, and in many cases, the, the solutions are already outside, and we just need to learn to, uh, to use them and in, to incorporate it into, into our own operations. Um, so, so I think we're basically on the same Perdimos la conexión creo, con Eduardo. Sí. Creo que tenemos la intervención nada más de Alejandro, que creo que nos quiere comentar algo. Adelante, Alejandro. Gracias. Ah, disculpa, Gabriela. Perdón. Sí, adelante, Gabriel. No, no simple, simplemente regresaba al punto de, de resiliencia, ¿no? la importancia que tiene la resiliencia dentro de estos esfuerzos que estaremos haciendo. Y creo que eh, en, en, en una gran medida estamos tocando territorios nuevos, estamos eh, entrando en, eh, para muchos de nosotros, territorios desconocidos, donde es importantísimo estar cómodos, donde eh, algunas de las veces no nos va a salir las cosas a la primera. Y estamos eh, entrando en un espacio de colaboración y de, de, de buscar nuevas formas de trabajar y de buscar nuevas eficiencias donde apenas es evidente, donde requerirá pues, mucho esfuerzo, eh, estar cómodos con, con la falla, saber que muchas veces fallaremos, pero cómo podemos aprender y cómo podemos pues, eh, incorporar estos aprendizajes para seguir moviendo estos esfuerzos. Así que simplemente quiero volver a recalcar el, el rol de, de, de la resiliencia ¿no? y cómo será importantísimo, independientemente en qué sector nos encontremos, de seguir intentando y seguir avanzando en los esfuerzos que hagamos tanto en digital como, como en los esfuerzos de colaboración con los diferentes actores. Agradezco mucho, Gabriel, y coincido contigo. Esto va a ser importante de cara a los a, a las foros, los paneles que vamos a tener en la tarde sobre resiliencia justamente, pero creo que hemos analizado los temas que van a topar transversalmente a, a este factor de resiliencia. Eh, queremos dar las gracias a sus, a sus comentarios, sus respuestas. Dar un pequeño espacio, si es que hubiera algún comentario de alguna delegación eh, complementario a lo que se ha mencionado aquí, alguna respuesta. Eh, adelante, por favor, caso contrario, te trasladaría la palabra a nuestra moderadora para poder cerrar esta parte del, del foro, agradeciéndoles nuevamente. Pero, por favor, si hubiera algún comentario final por parte de las delegaciones, nos encantaría poder escucharlos también. Yes, uh, uh, Daniel, uh, can, can you hear me? This is Ian Saunders from the United States. Adelante, Ian, por favor. I just wanted to take the floor very briefly to thank our public, our, our private sector uh, representatives for their intervention and sharing their perspectives today. Uh, I, I take the point that was made earlier that the scale of the challenges we face go beyond what any single government can handle alone. And I think partnership with the private sector is going to be a very important part of our moving forward. But their perspective was also very helpful because it helps us understand some of the things that they see can have the most direct and the, and, and, and the, and the quickest impact as we face these challenges. So I look forward to uh, working with the private sector in partnership on some of the ideas that we've heard today and really appreciate them taking the time to share their perspective to help guide our thinking as we look at ways forward uh, to improve competitiveness. So thank you. ¿Habría algún otro comentario, por favor, de las delegaciones? Si no, le, le cedo la palabra a nuestra moderadora. Muchas gracias. 
Muchas gracias entonces por este momento y ahora sí le agradecemos a todos quienes nos siguen en la transmisión, tanto en las redes como en las salas, por su participación en este espacio de la mañana. Corresponde ahora hacer una breve pausa para tomar un almuerzo virtual y volveremos a las 2 de la tarde en punto para continuar con la agenda. Los dejamos ahora con bella música e imágenes de Ecuador. Nos vemos en breve.